let's now go to upstate New York or midstate New York or, I don't know, 25 miles away from here where Pete Dominic, the host of Stand Up with Pete Dominic, is standing by. It's been a while. David Feldman, it is great to see you. It's been too long since we spoke. I'm very happy to be joining you and, and having a, a, another conversation be recorded. You know, I think it gives me a lot of credibility to be on your program because you're a well-known, respected a comedy writer. So, ah, that's so sweet of you. And I'm glad you're reading those Dale Carnegie books, learning how to yeah. say things you don't mean to influence people. Think Is that, that what he says? I never trusted him. No, I really mean it. I uh, I love talking to you. Yeah. I think you do a great, great program. Man. And what else can I tell you? Yeah. Happy to be here. You love me so much. And yet I have yet to be on your show. That's a good point. And if you're available tomorrow, I'm in desperate need of a guest. I will come on your show tomorrow and try to drive listeners away. That's that would, fine with me. That's fine with me. Let's go. Uh, you name the time and I will accommodate it for. Uh, I, would give, I would give anything to come on your show and push people. Away. No, I'm, I, I'll do your show tomorrow. I would yeah, love to. Done. Done. What time? Um, and pretty much I have two people booked right now, but I don't know what time they are yet. So you can say your time and, and take it. OK, who else is on the show? I'm interviewing a guy named David Feldman. He's a, a David Feldman. That, that's you. And then I'm interviewing a guy named David Campbell, who is an Australian. He's the anchor of the Today Show in Australia. And he's a pretty talented, very talented musician. And he happens to be my closest friend in the world. So he's a pretty big deal there. But more importantly, he's like uh, been a profound daily force because he and I talk every single day f going on two years. We talk on a, uh, an app, a video chatting app called Marco Polo every day, a couple times a day we check in and it's really we're very, I don't know, maybe codependent on each other at this point. That's normal. So you're both under pressure to host a show and you help each other. Or you're just friends. It has nothing to well, do with bo it. Well, bo both. I mean, he's he's probably more helpful than I am to him, but we both vent a lot. But he's under a lot of pressure. He's the host of a tel a daily national TV morning show. That's that's a lot. Right. I host a podcast called Stand Up with Pete Dominic, which is daily, and everybody should listen. Everybody should listen to your show. It's fantastic, except for tomorrow when I'm going to be your guest and you're taking a vacation. You're actually yeah, you'll be my, you'll be my guest during the vacation and because that'll post it next week. So, yeah, I'm going away next week for the first time in two years. My wife is teaching yoga at a resort in, in Cancun. And so it's like a very cheap vacation. And I've been working to build this podcast for two years since. Sirius XM kicked me out to the curb or didn't return, renew my contract. And, uh, and so it's been hard. I've, I've had a hard time taking time off. I'm not sure that's an interesting thing. It to is discuss, but I'm very interested in that. First of all, how many years were, were you with Sirius? Uh, I was there in total 14 years, but like having that's a amazing, that's amazing. Nobody gets nobody does. years. Nobody. Right. So, yeah, when I complained, I was complaining about how hard it was and how shocking and difficult it was to lose that gig to a comedian named Russ Maneve. And Russ started laughing at me. He goes, you had a 14 year gig. I don't feel bad for you. <laughs> wow. What a bastard. What's his name? Uh, yeah, Russ Maneve. I don't think he quite said it like that, but, you know, he, he put it into perspective and it meant it did mean a lot to me because. He's he was right about that. As a comic, I never expected, you know, you go gig to gig. And I did that for years right. and uh, never expected any kind of financial security. But then I desperately needed it and, and sought it out and, you know, worked at a bunch of different networks to to kind of have those CNN and, and Comedy Central as, a, as an audience warm up comedian with the Colbert Report and Daily Show and then and then doing Sirius XM. And so I had all these different revenue streams and making a lot of money for a long time. And then all of a sudden I'm I'm just getting nothing. And I've, I'm really proud of where I'm at now. Two years ago, I was terrified, shaking with anxiety. I thought I had Parkinson's cancer and MS at the same time. But in fact, I had nothing. I was just anxious. And now I've built up a, a, an empire. Yes. Seven years. You know, I think in the Old Testament, we're taught to view life in seven year cycles. Is that right? 
I don't know anything about that. I think it's seven years, and then you have a jubilee where you forgive all debts. I think it's seven years, maybe six. I try to, I do, I do write in a journal and have been for years. So I have chapters of my life and, and I break them down into years and decades. So I think your twenties and your thirties and your forties, you know, especially if you have kids, things are, are, are obviously a lot different. And so I break it down into decades and I'm in my mid 40, 40 decades. So that's where I'm at. That's yeah. how I feel. I think, I think the secret to life and I've never figured it out is not to plan your chapters. That when you turn a certain age, like Obama's turning 60, are you going? Uh, I, I, it sounds you're going to the party. No, I, I, I actually was. I was planning on going, but he, he canceled it. We were supposed to be in the vineyard and instead I'm going to uh, Cancun. Yeah. OK, I carpool. I usually carpool to these things with Spielberg and Clooney. But uh, Clooney, oh, yeah, I was I was going with uh, Hanks and Eddie Vedder. Yeah. Which is a fun car ride. But oh, yeah. well. But like George, Amal doesn't want to go because of the kids and she's worried. Anyway, it's a whole thing. I can understand. I can, I can understand that. I was talking to Ron Howard yesterday. You know, Ron. Oh, yeah. And, and he was planning, you know, you, 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 I felt like as, as a, like there's a minority, probably a minority at the Obama's party of whites. So I felt like as a white, you know, it felt like I was even more elite, but you know, yeah, we can do it over now he's just bringing and, I, and so now it's left for the rest of us invitees to to kind of wonder who did make the cut for a smaller party obviously oprah probably prince harry but you know you and i are, are out on the curb and i might you know, what's that you have to have a netflix deal you have to show yeah, yeah, a netflix deal proof of vaccination and a netflix deal <laughs> to come to yeah yes yeah. They're going to have a Netflix protocol officer there to test you to make sure you have a Netflix deal. Well, if, if they did film Obama's party, like I would definitely like pay for that. I am absolutely interested and fascinated by very rarely am I, am I interested in celebrity gossip or anything, but for sure, like that's the family that I met the Obama family. I'm into their, whatever they're doing. I'm, I'm interested in it. I I'll read about totally it. totally into them. My mother gets Christmas cards from the Obamas and they're framed, you know, they send out like 3 million Christmas cards. And oh, my, I didn't know that. Yeah. And my mother, I got a Christmas card. Uh, I used to have dreams. Um, I covered him so extensively at Sirius XM. I was in the room with him several times, never met him, but you know, in white house correspondence dinner or speeches at the, at the conventions. And, and, and I covered him and talked about him every day for years and years and years. And so I really felt like I've read his books. I, I really feel like I do know him. I got very close to interviewing her, Michelle Obama, and that fell through, but I had dreams that we were friends. It's so pathetic. Right. And people will tell you, don't idolize our leaders. They work for us. Yeah. But here's to be the fair, I also covered the bin Ladens extensively yeah. and had dreams that he and I vacationed together. So, you know, you you can't yeah. I can't control my dreams, Feldo. Right. <laughs> Likeability is very important. I'm thinking about Nina Turner losing in Ohio. Oh. 11. Yeah. And how unlike not that she's unlikable. But how unlikable some people I know are when it comes to politics and yeah, yeah, for yeah, better yeah. or worse, politics like comedy is like ability. I was thinking about working the road and I would get laughs. I would feed the jokes into a computer. It was garbage in, garbage out. And it was scientific. I don't know why I'm, my nose is very itchy. I think I'm allergic to alpha males. And <laughs> so this is like politics. You can feed, you can have somebody who checks all the boxes and you put them into the computer and you get the readout. Perfect. But nobody likes this person. And it, that was my problem. I learned this, you know, 15 years just doing stand up for a living. I, Technically, I did everything right on stage to get people to laugh. In the end, they did not like me. That was the problem. And the same applies to politics. Just because you're right on the issues and the computer printout, you check all the boxes. 
if the American people don't like you, they are not going to vote for you. I voted for Lindsey Boylan, who was running for Manhattan Bureau president. She was on my show last summer and I didn't like her. She, she I, I found her. She uh, she was not nice to me. You can play it back. She I accidentally used the term. I refer to somebody as being crazy. And she goes, I suffer from mental illness. How dare you? You And then she took to Twitter oh, wow. so, and she said, I'm so sick of old white men. Uh, it was like crazy. <laughs> and but, you know, I voted for her anyway, because she she accused Andrew Cuomo of sexually harassing her. She's very brave and outspoken. And I voted for her because she checked all the boxes. But I didn't like her. Because she was really rude to me. But I voted for her anyway. Uh, but most people in my position who were treated unfairly by her and on Twitter. I mean, she called me an old white man who is insensitive to the needs of the mental mentally ill. When I suffer from mental illness, I accidentally used the term crazy. And well, she decided to turn on me. But I voted for her anyway. But she didn't win. Uh, you got to be got to be likable. You, Everybody, you know, this isn't a man woman thing. Like, I'm not saying smile. I'm saying if you want to win. You got to be likable. I think it's a really good analogy to make between comedy and politicians. And it's true of, of, of a lot. you're selling yourself in both situations and and you want people to like you in both situations. And you said the American people. But I mean, it's true of town clerk. It's true of Board of Education. You have to make people like you. So the ideal candidate is someone who's qualified for this job, for any job. It's true of any job. And on paper, their resume looks great. And then when you talk to them, they sound great. I've always been someone who can win the interview and the performance, regardless of, of my resume. And I think a good example of this is for years at CNN and then at MSNBC and still, I would go on these major networks and I would be a commentator on some really, really uh, difficult issues, tough to understand, financial things like credit default swaps. I would, David, I would be on commenting about credit default swaps. Do I have a background in finance? No. Do I have a bachelor's degree? No. Do I even understand how my banking app works? I do not. But I could interview an expert on it, be really prepared for a two to three minute segment, and most importantly, be likable on it better than the guy who's an actual expert. I'd interview him and then I'd be the one that'd be the spokesman for the issue on TV. So I think it matters for everything from dating to comedy to winning over the, an audience. What's interesting in your situation is that she actually publicly insulted you and you still support her, which I think says a lot about you. Well, I, I she publicly insulted me. I did nothing wrong. I miss I accidentally referred to somebody I was talking about the cahoots. They, you, I understand. I understand that. And in being someone who suffers from mental illness doesn't obviously vindicate you or, or, or justify you calling someone crazy. You're a monster for saying that. But also you love to be hit. That's true. I just want to clear something up. She <laughs> took down Andrew Cuomo. That's one of the reasons I voted for her, even though I found her to be insufferably rude and uh, the thing I got to say, I just had this thought about Cuomo. I haven't shared anywhere. I want to bounce it off you. I've always had a, a very hard time with with someone who could look at Donald Trump and support them because he's such a terrible guy. But a lot of people would say, I hate him, but he's doing what's in my best interest on taxes or abortion or judges or whatever. I do. I do feel like every liberal Democratic supporter of Andrew Cuomo, anybody who's still supporting him, a surprising uh, amount of liberal Democrats are still supporting him. He lost conservatives in New York State a long time ago, but they don't matter. There's not enough of them. But I'm from those areas and, and live in one of those areas where the conservative New Yorkers hate him. However, those liberal Democrats that are still OK with Cuomo because he did a good job on this or on that or they think he's whatever they think. 
they're no better than the Trump supporters they're disgusted with. If a man behaves this way, it doesn't matter what he did for your schools or your taxes or your property or your gun laws or any. It doesn't matter. I, it, this is not one of those. You let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, this is this guy's a, sh- a shitty person. And if you support him, that says more about you being selfish than it does. Th- that's my thought. What do you think? If, is that a fair comparison? I think it's fair. I think if you're going to be a horrible person, you better do a lot more than what Andrew. Is he a horrible per- Is he a horrible person? Is Andrew Cuomo. How do you quantify that? He's the son of Mario Cuomo. So it doesn't make him that doesn't make someone horrible. I mean, uh, you know, you know, you know, Phil Hitler. Phil He's a good guy. Schickel Gruber. He, he went back to the original name. He didn't trade oh, he, on his father's yeah. success. No, if you're going to if you're going to run in the shadow of your beloved father, Mario Cuomo, who is really overrated. Nevertheless, he didn't make it on his own. He was brought in. He's like George W. Bush. He came in and was the hit man for Mario when Mario yeah, was gone. He was the muscle. Yep, for sure. He was the hit man. And he's like every son who inherits the father's business, a immense sense of entitlement and fear that people are going to find out how inadequate he is. So you you become a bully. That's the sons of sons who take over their father's business tend to be bullies because they know deep in their heart that if they had to actually work for this, they would be passed over. That's a and very I'm, interesting theory. And I, I'm it's sure they're not theory. It's true. Well, so I'm he, sure there are examples where the son ran the business better, more fair than the dad did or something like that. But I think there's probably a lot of truth to that. Anybody who has, you know, it was, it was very rich to listen to Megan, uh, Megan McCain complaining this week or criticizing the Cuomo family for their nepotism. It's like nepotism is something that you should be really concerned with and, and try to, it's not your fault that you're born into this family, you, you know, but you should be conscious of the fact that your last name is, you know, Cuomo or McCain and you should try to separate. I, I think that like Bo Biden uh, did a good job at establishing himself uh, outside of that. It wasn't his fault that his dad was Joe Biden. He tried to make that family better. He tried to be better than Joe Biden. I think Hunter Biden, you know, had a similar struggle with with that. It's not his fault. So I, I find that interesting, no matter who you are, even if it's someone in your town, your dad owned the lumber mill and now you're running it. Well, what does that mean for you? What kind of guy are you? What did you learn? Did you earn it? Did you actually cut the wood? Did you do the work or did you just take the name and the business and everything that came with it and andrew cuomo like george w bush vowed that he wasn't going to make the same mistakes his father made so he's going to be more cutthroat more determined so andrew cuomo like george w bush surpassed the father yeah yeah getting reelected uh Andrew got reelected more times than his father. And of course, George W. Bush got reelected and his father didn't. The price that they paid was immense. You know, I, I have a relationship with Chris Cuomo. We worked together at, at Sirius XM, shared a studio. And uh, he, he, he's also a really tough guy. Very, very smart. Very uh, funny. He even knows how to use humor. Like that's he, he has a skill set and he also, you know, it, it did a lot of the work. He does a really good job in many ways. I mean, you can you know, he, he, he's playing the, the cable news game. We can criticize all of that. But as far as a player in that game, he's a pretty good player. I don't I don't watch it or or wouldn't wouldn't practice myself that way. But it's a the whole family is, you know, uh, these these they're all these tough Italian guys and someone. You know, for me, it's hard because I come from an Italian family. My wife is Sicilian. I've been to Sicily many times. I speak the language and I hate all those stereotypes of that. I hate them. You speak Sicilian? I don't speak Sicilian. I speak some, I should say, I'm sorry, stolen down. I speak some Italian. I can, I can get by on Italian. Wow. And I, and I'm Italian and I just, I hate all those stereotypes uh of you know these tough guy stereotypes and and obviously the the kind of the corruption that a lot of people think comes along with italian businessmen or politicians like i hate all that shit and they embody that a little bit too much i had a big argument on this show about a year ago 
And I said that comedy writing rooms make fun of Italians, that tell of it that it has become OK. The only group of people that you can legally make fun of these days is Italian men. <clears throat> and I, you know, my father was very friendly with somebody who was a member of the Italian Anti-Defamation League. Uh, Joe Colombo, do you remember him? No. You remember him from that's a Columbus Circle? Got shot. No. The, uh, remember the Italian Anti-Defamation League? No. Huh? No. <laughs> what is this? Omerta? No, I mean, I just don't, I don't know what that is. You want me to fucking lie and tell you I know what something is that I don't know what it is? I don't know you what know it is. You know what the Italian Anti-Defamation League? Do you remember no, the... If you, say it, if you say it one more time, it'll make me feel that much more insecure that I don't know what this thing is. Like, you've said three times you don't know who C-3PO is. No, I never saw the movie. I did oh, see that movie, yeah, but that yeah. was a uh, parallel example of what you're doing to me. You're drilling me into the ground and making me feel lesser than for not knowing this organization. Is it like the Jewish Anti-Defamation League? They don't, de don't be mean to... Don't be yes. OK, yes. well, now I know from context what it is. But I, honest to God, I'm not a member. Oh, OK. And so I don't think they're still around. It was set up by Joseph Colombo, who was the leader of the Colombo family. And he was trying to. The mafia boss. The mafia boss wanted to put it into is. the I stereotype know. that all Italians were in the mafia. And then he had a big rally at Columbus Circle. I don't know, in the 70s, and it was, uh, he was shot. Uh, he later died from it. Uh, taxi driver is based sort of on that scenario. Well, I mean, were you getting at a question because I have something to say? Yeah, I, well, let me, just, let me just give you some interesting information. If you go back and watch Taxi Driver, Remember Leonard so Harris plays the politician where the assassination attempt is, t that is a kind of, Scorsese took that from oh. Columbo's, the, the assassination of Columbo at Columbus Circle for the Italian Anti-Defamation League. And there was a time when like Alka-Seltzer would do a commercial like, Mamma Mia, that's a spicy Amita ball. And Italians, and rightfully so, found it offensive and they wanted it taken down. I have noticed that it's OK to make fun of Italians and I don't approve of it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't care at all. I make fun of Italians a lot. Like I don't, I don't. Yeah, I don't really, I don't really like a lot of them myself. I mean, I, I come from an Italian family. My wife is as Italian as they come. I love a lot of things about the culture. I really do. I love visiting there. I've been there many times, but um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bad stuff too. And, and, and these, these, these stereotypes that have been created about a bad Italian, a lot of them, aren't great. And, and so a lot of, you know, like my wife's aunt who she's very close with is like, was like the deputy mayor of a, of a town, a city in Sicily. And so she's fighting, she's a good person fighting corruption. And so I hear from her, her interpretation of corruption and, and organized crime in Sicily. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm related to a woman who's fighting corruption. And so I hate corruption and I hate the mafia and because they, they give a bad name to Italians and even more specifically Sicilians. So, you know, but I'm not going to, I'm also not going to lead the fight to try to reclaim the good name of the Italian ethnicity and all that. Like, I don't, I don't really care. I don't think we're struggling um, or we're discriminated against so much or, or that our limit, that our opportunities are limited because of our ethnic our Italian ethnic heritage. I think that counts now as one of the good ones. One of the, you know, real Americans, I think are Italians. Boy, are you wrong? <laughs> I just figured I'd say that. Hey, before we go. Well, there's no else more of a real American than maybe like some, you know, like a wasp or like, what's the most quintessential quote, real white American? Because of course they're white, real yeah. Americans. So well, I, I think real Americans are first peoples. No, 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 no. And by that, I mean the Puritans. Yes. <laughs> Just I'm joking. It was a joke. Hey, you're going on vacation. Two, I, um, how long is the vacation? One week at a resort and I was struggling 
you know, someone gave me, I'll never forget hearing this, that you got to take a two week vacation because the first week is just learning how to uh, relax and, and, and get away from your normal day to day life, as well as figure out, you know, this place that you're at and the, the things that you want to do and where you want to be. And that always stuck with me because you know, I'd love to have a two week vacation. This is just a one week vacation. And so I'm trying to go into it more well planned out than ever before. And my big thing Feldman is, is to, to stay away from screens as much as humanly possible news, social media, and even cameras. My family probably won't. I'll let them take the pictures. I usually take the pictures on, uh, on vacation. I'll use their phones. So I'm bringing pens and paper and, and, you know, books. And I really want to try to get away from screens and see what that does to my entire Exist. What are you going to do? What are you going to do if Trump holds a rally and he walks on stage and vomits? Just throws up. Um, well, obviously, but now, if that's the case, I will. If that's the case, I imagine the world would freeze waiting for my tweet. Yes. You a well-deserved vacation. A vacation is an act of faith. The what do you Sabbath, mean? is an act of faith uh, saying to God, let me, let me tell you, yeah. let me sanction. I love the Sabbath idea. I like it a lot. Bless your vacation. Okay. Thank you. The idea of sacrificing on the altar meat is to say to God, this goes back to the pagans. God, I am sacrificing this oxen. I know it could feed us for a year but I'm sacrificing this oxen to you to show proof of my faith in you. I know that you will give and give and give. So I could feed myself with this oxen, but instead I will sacrifice it for you. And then depending on what religion you belong to, I think, I think in the old uh, temple, the, the, the priests, the Jewish priests, they were called priests back then, would eat the, the sacrificed animal. Hey, let's not waste here. I mean, I believe in God, but there's no <laughs> let's not waste here. That's a good cut of meat. That's a nice cut. That's a that's a flank. Well, I appreciate that offer of sacrifice uh, and uh, as a way to to bless my vacation. That's quite no one's ever done done or said anything quite so generous. So thank you that I feel like good. Throwing about. a virgin into a volcano. I'm fully by the way, that's that, what you should do in Cancun. You should throw a virgin into a volcano and say to God, this is a beautiful virgin. Sometimes I know that you provide. I will throw this virgin into the volcano as an act of faith to you, my Lord. Some, sometimes do you ever find yourself just being shocked by what the far right or the right comes up with in terms of an argument or, or a conspiracy? Because Sometimes I'm like, well, they can't, no one could possibly believe. For example, the, one of the hardest things to believe is that there's a microchip in the vaccine. That's impossible to believe because you just think about how small it'd have to be and how do you get it in there and blah, blah, blah. Why. And I think that someone, a Republican running today could say, listen, we want to sacrifice more virgins in volcanoes. We think that's going to make America better. And I think that they would, if Trump said it, it would garner a certain percentage of support. OK, before you go, I just came up with a TikTok video that somebody needs to make. Let's go. Can you make a spoon stick to your cranium? You ever see people who can do yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Somebody should do a TikTok video and send it to us of their saying, I just got <laughs> I just got the vaccine and I'm magnetic now. Tenpenny, Dr. Tenpenny. Yes, I remember. That. Somebody should make a TikTok video and with the spoon sticking to their forehead going, look at this. I'm magnetic now. Hey, uh, I saw something fun on TikTok. That was so funny. What? I love TikTok. I do, too. I'm, I'm addicted to it. There's nothing more addictive. It was a 16 year old kid and he was visiting his grandpa, his grandfather. And he says, uh, Grandpa, spell uh, IHOP. You know, the pancake house well uh, now imagine doing this to like a, a 70 year old man S grandpa spell i hop and then after you spell it say ness i h o p ness <laughs> <laughs> that is what 
That gave me so much faith in humanity. When well, I well, your 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 TikTok feed is as a result of what you click on and what you watch the longest. So it says a lot about how awful of a person or how creepy you are. And mine is all couples playing silly pranks on each other. Mm. What's wrong with me? I I love uh, cats and dogs sleeping together. Oh, those are good. Yeah. Okay. I love you, buddy.